of our readings this evening. It's the third of them to which I want to draw your attention, either in the order of service or if you have a copy of the New Testament with you, the verses in Luke's Gospel, chapter 2 and verses 8 to 20. Every Christmas time, somebody probably says to you, uh, as someone said to me just the other day, the thing about Christmas is that it's a great time for the children. The thing about Christmas is that it's a great time for the children. It's interesting if you happen to look through the Christmas cards you have received that you will find probably that children do not feature on them quite so much as that saying would suggest. We think at Christmas time of Mary and Joseph, of wise men and shepherds, and they feature very prominently on your Christmas cards. And then there are others who feature prominently in Christmas cards. They also feature extraordinarily prominently in Christmas carols, and they feature rather prominently in the pages of the gospel stories about the birth of Jesus. It's true for us that Christmas is a time for children, but it was certainly true of the first Christmas that it was what I'd like to call a time for angels. It was an extraordinary time for angels. And one of the marvelous things, certainly if you are a minister of Jesus Christ at Christmas time, one of the marvelous things about the Christmas narratives in the Gospels is that there are enough people gathering round Bethlehem at the time of our Lord's birth for you never to need to repeat exactly the same point of view in the way in which the Bible looks at the meaning of Christmas. And I want this evening as a kind of early Christmas present for you to unwrap what the New Testament, the Gospel of Luke particularly here in this passage, has to teach us about what Christmas looks like from an angel's point of view. I say that because for years and years I've been fascinated by what angels might think. It's obvious from the Bible that they do a good deal of thinking, and some of them obviously also do a great deal of moving around the universe in extraordinary ways. But Jesus, the Bible tells us, is the king of the angels. And Jesus was becoming an infant. What did angels think about that? There's a marvelous verse in the first chapter of the letter written by the Apostle Peter in which he speaks about our experience of Jesus as something, and these are his words, into which angels long to look. They do not experience Jesus as their Savior, the way Christians experience Jesus as their Savior. But angels apparently have an inveterate curiosity to wonder what it was like for Jesus, the Son of God, to do what He did at Christmas time, and what it must be like to be on the receiving end of that as we ourselves are, as we come to trust in Jesus Christ. And this passage in Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, is one of several passages surrounding the story of the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, in which, yes, we get the point of view of these shepherds who were out there watching their sheep that evening, but we're also told some interesting things that give us a very dramatic picture and perspective on what the inner meaning of the Christmas story is. And I want you, if you can, to follow through with me in this passage in Luke's Gospel as I try and pick out and underline 
several things that this passage has to say about these angels and their understanding of the inner meaning of Christmas. The first thing that you notice, or certainly ought to notice, was the first thing that the shepherds noticed in verses 8 to 9. And that was the absolutely overwhelming appearance of the angel of the Lord. Verse 9, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and as that angel of the Lord appeared to them, the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. I asked the children in church if any of them had ever seen an angel. I might as well ask you the question this evening, has any of you ever seen an angel? I suppose there would be few of us, if any of us, who would claim that we had ever seen an angel. And that underlines for us what was also true of these shepherds. These shepherds did not see angels around every corner. The appearance of this angel was as unexpected to them as it would be to you. Unexpected because it was a very rare event. The Bible is not full of the appearances of angels. They appear very, very infrequently and only at the most significant times in the unraveling of God's purposes. But this was not only a rare event. This was an amazing event simply because of the identity of those to whom the angel of the Lord was appearing. And this, for Luke, who loved to see the ways in which Jesus Christ made himself known to the poor and the marginalized, this was something that fascinated and delighted Luke, the author of this gospel, that it was to shepherds, that the angel of the Lord appeared for the simple reason that unlike our society in which even we city dwellers have a kind of lingering affection and respect for shepherds, shepherds in this society were the most despised people of the whole crowd. They were counted as marginally above those who had leprosy. They were utterly mistrusted and treated generally as rogues. And yet, it was to them that the angel of the Lord came with the message of the birth of the Lord's Christ. Absolutely unexpected. These words here remind us of something the Apostle Paul who was a very close friend of Luke, who wrote this gospel, of something Paul has to say. He says, God, you know, does not choose the high and mighty in this world. God is not impressed by intellectual ability. God delights to come to the poor and to the simple and to the marginalized and to make himself known to them to demonstrate that he is an altogether gracious, loving God who is willing to bring his salvation to the poorest and the meanest, the least and the lowest. And so it was on the night of the birth of our Lord Jesus. It can only be the case, although Luke does not tell us that it is the case, it can only be the case Because the king of the angels, the Lord Jesus, had given his angels, and especially this particular angel of the Lord, specific instructions, make sure the night in which I am brought forth into the world, that you go out into the fields of Bethlehem and tell despised shepherds that the Savior has come. So this was an overwhelming experience for these shepherds because of who they were. It was an overwhelming experience for them also, Luke tells us, because of what they saw. They saw 
the glory of the Lord shining around them. And we are told, look at verse 9, they were terrified. It's actually an interesting thing. Uh, I notice it every Christmas as I read through these Christmas stories again, that every time this announcement about the birth of Jesus is given to somebody, that person immediately goes into a state of panic. Mary, Joseph, when Herod hears the message, when these shepherds hear the message. But here Luke tells us exactly what it was that caused the terror, the sense of panic in these shepherds. It was the fact that the glory of the Lord lit up the night sky. And they were afraid. They were disturbed. They felt no longer in command. And that's so interesting because these shepherds, they were on night duty. And presumably these particular shepherds were always on night duty. They were used to the night. They were men who were not afraid of the dark. And here Luke tells us in this marvelous picture he gives to us that these strong, rough men who boasted in the fact that they were never afraid of the dark were actually afraid of the light. Remember when you were a little boy, if you're no longer a little boy, going to the seaside or just playing around and lifting up a big stone and the light shining and all these funny wee creatures and beetles beetling away, running away from the exposure of the light, seeking some dark place where they could hide. Well, that was the experience of these shepherds, strong men, They, as somebody said in this very building yesterday afternoon, they didn't have any sins that they needed to worry about. Why then be so absolutely terrified when they saw the glory of the Lord? Because this was not only the beginning of a revelation that they were going to hear about the birth of Jesus. This was really a revelation of where they themselves were in relationship to God. They were in the dark, and they simply couldn't bear to have the light shining on them, exposing the darkness. They weren't able to cope with God. That's a striking thing, isn't it? I've heard many people say to me, if God would just show himself to me, then I bet some of these shepherds, as they were out there arguing in the fields at night over the years, talking about the rabbis, talking about what was going on in the local synagogue, some of them would say, if this God would just show himself to me, then I would get things sorted out. And they just didn't know what they were talking about. They didn't understand that if the glory of the Lord is revealed, if God comes to you, if God really, really comes to you, then the ground begins to rumble and shake beneath your feet and you put your hand over your mouth and you simply do not know what to say. And that was their experience. The overwhelming appearance of an angel. And yet here is one of the great paradoxes of the Christian gospel and of the teaching of the Bible. That that sense of being overwhelmed by the glory of God, the light of God that exposes the darkness of our lives is something God does not to make us run into further darkness, but to draw us out into His marvelous light. And that's what you see happening in this passage the angel of the Lord with the overwhelming appearance 
comes to them, and you'll notice now in verses 10 to 12, he brings to them a message of glorious good news. Yes, at first sight, he has an overwhelming, glorious appearance. But then, as they begin to listen to him, he brings them a message of glorious good news. And Luke, who is very sophisticated in the way in which he paints this picture, tells us this good news really as though it were the headline of the Bethlehem Times. These few words of the angel's announcement answer all the basic questions that you need answered about Jesus. The when question, tonight, the where question, in Bethlehem. What has happened? The Savior has been born. Who is He? He is Christ the Lord. But then in this birth announcement, there is one little phrase that that if you think about it, it kind of jars on what you expect. It's not quite what you expect in a birth announcement. Read the Herald tomorrow or any other paper. Perhaps you read the more upmarket papers, the Times and the Telegraph and the Guardian and the Independent. Well, you look at the announcements of birth there, and they are all likely to say that a newborn baby has been born to whom? Well, to the mother and father. Do you notice what this angel of the Lord says to these shepherds? Tonight, in the town of Bethlehem, a Savior has been born to you. To you. Isn't that an amazing thing to say? They were not the parents. They had nothing to do with this baby. This was the first they'd heard about this baby. And in the very way in which the angel of the Lord brings the message to them, the angel of the Lord underlines that this baby is altogether different in one very important respect from every other baby who has ever been born. This baby is not born merely to his mother. This baby has been born to. He has been born for these shepherds and indeed for others. He has been born to you the angel says, as a Savior, as a Savior. I want to come back to that in a moment or two because it's of tremendous significance as we try and think about what is this Christmas story really all about? What is it to you? Because you see, it can be anything to them. It can be anything to others. It can be the the greatest story ever told, the most marvelous message an individual has received. But that isn't really the question. The question is, for these shepherds and for you and me, the question is, what is it to you? Well, they could have dodged the question if it had been one of the other shepherds had been asking it. None of your business. But this was the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord was demanding from them an answer. What is this baby to you? Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. What is he to you? And marvelously, you notice, with that message, as is very typical of the way in which God works in the Bible, the angel gives them not only the good news of the baby's birth, but he gives them a sign. He says, you'll find this baby, this is verse 12 now, you'll find this baby wrapped in cloths. The older versions quite accurately said swaddling cloths or swathing bands and lying in a manger. Here was how they would be sure that they'd found the right baby of all the babies in Bethlehem. This particular baby would be found not in a home, 
but in a stable, not in a cradle, but in a feeding trough, an animal's feeding trough, in a manger. But not only was that going to be the sign that this was the baby that the angel of the Lord had spoken about, he says, now that baby, and this did not distinguish the baby Jesus from any other baby in that day, lying in a manger distinguished him from all other babies, this made him common with all other babies. You'll find the baby, the newborn baby who has been wrapped in swaddling bands, And you'll know this baby wrapped in swaddling bands is the baby who is going to be the Savior because he is lying in a manger. What's the significance of that? I think I'm right in saying that this country of ours was the first country in which people realized that it was folly to wrap newborn babies in swaddling bands. We have given the the world many different things, but that may be the most unusual insight that Scottish people have ever given the world, that you you don't wrap babies up in swaddling bands. Why did they wrap babies up in swaddling bands? Because they believed that given the frailty and the plasticity of a baby's limbs, if you didn't wrap that baby up very tightly in swaddling bands, then the day would come when the baby's limbs would deteriorate. Wrapping a baby up in swaddling bands was a piece of mistaken medical counsel in the first century in which Jesus was born. Isn't that something? This will be a sign to you that the Son of God will come from heaven. He will be found lying in a manger, wrapped like every other baby of his time in swaddling bands that do him absolutely no good. And this baby wrapped up in swaddling bands is none other than the Lord. And actually the word that Luke uses, Luke's probably the one gospel writer who was a Gentile, who belonged to the Roman world, in which the word kurios was the word that was used in his Greek Old Testament always to translate the divine name Jehovah. And Luke himself full well understood what the angel of the Lord was saying to these shepherds that was so extraordinary, such glorious good news, that the Son of God was coming into the world not to be born in a palace, but to be laid in a manger. He was coming into the world so really, so profoundly coming to share our nature that he would enter into, come underneath, the profoundest weakness, and even be subject to the medical ignorance of his own times. He would do all that, all of that, in order to become the Savior of sinful men and women like ourselves. And Luke, like his companion Paul later on in Philippians chapter 2, sees this event as an amazing illustration of the way in which the Son of God humbled Himself as He made that journey of almost infinite distance between heaven's glory and the stable in Bethlehem and the manger and the swaddling bands in which He was tightly wound to show us what great distance the Lord is prepared to come down, to descend, to humble Himself in order to become our Savior and our friend. And here the Christmas story touches the very heart of the Christian gospel. 
it's almost like a hint to these shepherds and a hint to us as we read the gospel that he has come down from heaven's highest and he is on his way to earth's lowest, not just to the manger and the swaddling bands, but eventually to the cross. This body that in its earliest infancy is wrapped and held tight in swaddling bands is destined in 33 years' time to be wrapped and held tight by ropes to another piece of wood, wrapped and held tight by nails to another piece of wood. And Luke understands as he tells us the story of the angel of the Lord's announcement to these shepherds that this is just the first picture they are going to have of all that it takes the Son of God to come into the world to be the Savior. A couple of weeks ago on the radio, one of the more classical music stations, they were playing Bach's Christmas Oratorio. Bach was not only an extraordinary musician and composer, he was really a very fine interpreter of the Christian message. There is a part in Bach's Christmas oratorio once he has told the story of the decree going out from Caesar Augustus and Mary and Joseph making their journey. He interposes a choral with these words in which we are encouraged to sing the praises of this Christ who is born in Bethlehem. How shall I fitly meet thee and give thee welcome, Jew? The nations long to greet thee, and I would greet thee too. But do you know what the tune is he uses? The tune he uses is the tune, O sacred head, sore wounded, with grief and pain weighed down. It's the tune that he uses elsewhere to express the passion, the dying, the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see what he has seen, the very same thing that Luke sees, that the inner meaning of this baby's birth is that this baby has been born in order that he might hang on the cross for the sins of the world. And the inner meaning of welcoming and greeting this baby is not just going to the manger and seeing a beautiful newborn child, if you think newborns are beautiful, but going to the manger and seeing this child who has come from heaven's glory in all the humiliation and shame and rejection of the outstable and the manger and the swathing bands and the weakness and the poverty, and the rejection that surrounds him. And it is this that is the inner meaning of the angel's glorious message. That's why, do you notice now in verses 13 and 14, you see a third thing. The passage speaks about the angel's overwhelming appearance and about his glorious good news. But then it goes on, particularly in verses 13 and 14, to describe an outburst of heavenly praise. Suddenly, the angel of the Lord is no longer alone. Suddenly, the angel of the Lord is accompanied by a vast multitude. What we are told in verse 13 is a great company of the heavenly host appearing with the angel. Here is the angel of the Lord appearing, as we would now say, if it had been in the Bethlehem times the next day, it would have been the angel of the Lord appeared with a cast of thousands who were praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace to men, on whom his favor rests. It's interesting, by the way, I don't know if it's significant that it doesn't say they were actually singing, but I've no doubt that when you hear angels speaking, it sounds like our singing, and they were praising God. 
And here we get an insight into how well, although they themselves did not need this experience, they had this great insight into what it meant to understand that Jesus Christ has been born to you as a Savior. The thing for which they praise God is His favor or grace. That without these shepherds having done anything to deserve it, what could they do to deserve it? God was showering His grace upon them. And the result of that would be that as they trusted this message, they would experience the peace of God covering their lives and flooding their hearts. And the result of that would be that they would want to give praise and glory to God. Fascinating that when you look at the greatest letter in the New Testament, Paul's letter to the Romans, and right at the heart of that letter where he summarizes the message of the Christian gospel, in Romans chapter 5, the first few verses, he uses exactly the same three ideas. When the grace of God touches my life and I respond to what He has done in Jesus Christ by faith, then I have peace with God and I begin to rejoice in my hope, he says, of sharing in the glory of God. These angels, they do not need Christ's work because they have never sinned, but they admire it. They want to understand it. In a way, I think they would say to me if I said, you know, I don't think that kind of thing is for me. I think they would say, you don't understand what you're talking about. They would want to take me by the lapels and say, this is the most important thing in the world. We know we're angels. We've seen it all. We understand. And here for a brief moment, uniquely in the Christmas stories, It is as though God says to a multitude of angels who are watching this scene at a great distance, go and join Him. You can almost sense that behind the scenes, these angels are looking to the throne of God as they listen to this staggering announcement that's being made. And they're looking to the throne of God saying, can we go too? Can we go too? And they burst as it were, out of heaven onto the earth. And they want to praise God so that these shepherds will hear and take in the significance of the message that they have received. And from this moment onwards, whenever there is a great crisis point in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, one or more angels will appear. As though, as though the angels in heaven quizzically look into the face of God and say, what are you, what are you doing with your son? Why is he going through these temptations in the wilderness? Why does he suffer so in the garden of Gethsemane? Why is his body laid there dead in the tomb? As Jesus emerges exhausted, from his 40-day struggle against the powers of darkness, we're told that he was given angelic help. When he agonized in the Garden of Gethsemane, thinking about the horror he was going to experience under the judgment of God the next day on the cross of Calvary, an angel was allowed to come and strengthen him. Alexander White, the famous minister of St. George's West in Edinburgh in the 19th century used to say that once he got to heaven after seeing the face of the Lord Jesus Christ, the next one he longed to speak to was the angel who came to strengthen Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane to ask that angel, what was it like? What did he go through for me? And even when he was arrested, Jesus says, you know, I could call twelve legions of angels to my side to deliver me. 
But I must do my Father's will. I must be bound to the cross. I've come into the world not to save myself, but to save others. No wonder angels stood sentry when Jesus rose from the grave and angels witnessed his ascension and return to heaven's glory because they want to understand, they want to see, they want to ponder, they want their hearts to overflow with a sense of love and wonder and praise at what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. And you know the surest sign on earth that you are beginning to take this in, the surest sign on earth is that you begin to do what the angels did. That you begin to do, you'll notice, what the shepherds did. Verse 15, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. That's always the genuine mark of somebody who has begun to understand the message of Christmas. That a new instinct arises, a new desire is awakened. It wasn't there before. Perhaps the opposite was there before. It doesn't come because you've conjured it up or because you've sat yourself down and said, now I need to think about the Christian faith that comes as God begins to work in your life, as perhaps He begins to invade your life, not by sending angels from heaven, but other kinds of angels. An angel is just a word for a messenger. In your case, the messenger may be somebody else. In your case, the messenger may be some great trial that you're going through. In your case, the messenger may be disappointment. In your case, the messenger may be, as somebody said to me during the week, that life didn't seem to have any real point or significance for all that person was filling it with all kinds of things. And you begin to say, it doesn't matter what any of the others say, I think I need to go and see. I think I need to go and see. I need to go and see. I need to understand. I need to look into these things that the Lord has made known to us. I hope there's somebody in the building tonight who's like that. I hope it for a very personal reason. It's a purely romantic reason, but it is a personal reason. This Christmas, 40 years ago when I was a teenager, was the very first time I began to feel a desire, a drive, an interest, a compulsion to look into these things, to see if they were true, to see if I could find Christ, to see if this message that the angel of the Lord brought and these other angels with him of grace and peace and glory, to see if this could possibly be true. And I remember 40 years ago, God sent me the nearest thing I've ever met to an angel. For all I know, he maybe was an angel. As a teenage boy, I slithered to a halt beside an elderly, a little elderly man dressed from head to toe in black. I had been seeking. I'd started going to church on Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings. I longed to see whether what this book said about Jesus was true or not and whether it could be true for me. And we slithered to a halt in the ice and he looked at me and I saw his eyes glancing down to the Bible I was holding in my hands. And he said these words to me. 
Under other circumstances, I might have laughed or I might have run. But he said to me, Are you saved, son? Are you saved? And big teenage tears began to flow down my cheeks as he spoke to me. Because I couldn't believe the man I'd never met, never saw him again, all my life or his life, that we could have slithered to a halt that night and that he could have asked me the one question in the whole universe to which I wanted to give the answer yes, but could only give the answer no. Perhaps that's where you are tonight. Here's the good news. To you, this day, in the city of Bethlehem, a Savior has been born. He is Christ the Lord. And this experience that the angel invited these poor marginalized shepherds into can be your experience too, as it certainly has been my experience. You can go and you can find that it is exactly as the messenger told you. And then perhaps like thousands, millions of others over these past 2,000 years, you will find like these shepherds that once you have seen him, you will want to spread the word concerning what was told them about this child. The angels who don't need salvation, if you asked an angel, are you saved? The angel would say, well, the great thing about being an angel God has kept is that I've never sinned and so I've never needed salvation. But you can't say that. If a holy angel were to appear before you, you would, like these shepherds, you would want to cover your face and run because you know you can't stand in the holy presence of God's glory. That's why he has come down so far from heaven's glory to seek you. That's why he sends angels, messengers, human and divine today to say to you, there is a Savior born to you, Christ the Lord. Now go and seek him, find him, trust him. And discover that everything that has been said about him is true. Won't you do that? Otherwise, it's another passing and empty Christmas. But with this and with him, it's Christmas forever. And you'll know it. You will know it. Because he's promised. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we are amazed at the story of Christmas. We recognize as we read about things that are way beyond our experience that this is all too good not to be true. We come to you tonight, many of us just like these shepherds, poor and needy, having argued about you and argued with you, argued against you. We want to place our lives before you, before the light of your presence and your truth. We want to hear you say to us, there is a Savior born to you. And we want your grace, Father, 
so that we will no longer say, for me, but by faith in Jesus Christ, know that he is for us a Savior and a Lord. And this we pray together in Jesus' name. Amen.